In terms of screening, of course, you know, LDL cholesterol is kind of obvious. What about LP little a, not to confuse the audience with stuff, <laughs> but the European guidelines did come out and say everybody should have an LP little a measured at least once in their life. Are you? Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of LP little a, and we, we identified and just published recently the youngest person, as far as we know, she was 27 years old and smoked a couple of cigarettes a day, LDL levels in a 120, 140 range, but she had an LP little a, which should be less than 75 nanomoles uh, per liter, it was over 500. And she ended up having an MI and bypass surgery, age 27. So there is unquestionably a lot of physicians who have not been screening for high LP little a, and, and I think it's really important in patients or families who have premature disease and you can't explain the extent of disease based on their risk factors. Absolutely. Some, of the, what if they don't some of the nihilism, I think, comes from the fact that historically we didn't have any good ways to treat it, but that's about to change. And you know, I think uh, Christie's well aware of this, but uh, we're about to launch a, uh, a very large clinical trial with an anti sensagonal nucleotide that lowers LP little a about 80%. And we're going to enroll the first patient uh, in December of 2019. And right around the corner. You know, <laughs> A thousand, a thousand sites in 48 countries, and we're very optimistic that this a risk factor. Let me make a point about LP little a. It's nobody's measuring it. I've done grand rounds at various places around the country. I did it. I won't mention the institution, a very famous institution in America, not yours. Uh, and uh, and I asked for a show of hands. Uh, we had about 150 people in the audience at grand rounds. How many of you have ordered an LP little a in the last month? and three hands went up. And I was shocked, you know, because we measure it in every single patient in our prevention clinic and have for more than a decade. Uh, there are 1.4 billion people on the planet Earth that have an LP little a above 60 or 70 milligrams per deciliter. You know, I mean, we have two sets of units, both animals and milligrams. So this is an incredibly prevalent disorder and it's not being identified because it can't be treated. That's going to change. And when that changes, we're gonna to have to educate everybody about it. I know all of you are big believers in it, but uh, do you believe what the ESC guidelines said was not just high risk, they said all people should have LP little a measured at least I, once. I, I think you it's agree? Re reasonable to do this because basically you're already, we've already talked about that the, the major theme or problem with prevention is too little, too late. And so it's a little bit, uh, you know, for me, early on, when I, I was still a resident, and, you know, I, I loved, uh, you know, we'd go to the uh, patient and get admitted. That back then used to be big anterior mice, they'd be hypotensive. We would swan them in the ER, take them up, and do all, do all the drips, manage the patients. But we just were watching the natural history. You know, we'd listen every day, did they get a VSD? Okay, let's go to the OR. I mean, but it was, it, it really wasn't, it was pre. So this shows my age. It was pre-lytics, pre-PCI, and so I realized, you know, all we're doing is pediating symptoms. We're not treating the disease process of atherosclerosis, and so we've, we're much better now with our early interventions, but still many people don't treat the disease process, and so it's a little bit like being a fireman. You know, it's, when the fireman comes in and rescues somebody in the, in the second floor, third floor, and brings a child out, it's wonderful, but the building has already been burnt to the ground and people are dying. Uh, now, as a preventive cardiologist, it's more like going by and putting smoke alarms in the houses <laughs> and <laughs> making sure things are designed well in the kitchen and stove. I mean, it's boring, but <laughs> it's not dramatic. But in fact, you prevent far more lives and fires by good design and prevention than you do having a, catastrophically coming at the last second I'm at an institution where we, we have a wonderful history for heart transplants and VADs and things like that, but it's, and it's heroic and it's, it's wonderful for the patients, but we ignore the early part. So if you get a high LPA level, even if we don't have a specific therapy, you know that they're at increased risk, so diet and exercise, they do work. And that patient needs to not smoke, blood pressure control. Lipid control, statins shown in Jupiter, primary prevention. Take LPA, everything else off the table. Still works. The other things all, all benefit. So it's useful to give, and I think we should empower our patients. If someone knows they're at increased risk, then it's, and you said, Steve, it's very common. We're doing right now genomic, 
we're giving a battery to our thousand people in our cardiology clinic are going to get gene panel, 158 genes sequenced. Uh, they get a polygenic risk score. They get LPA variants. They have pharmacogenomics. And the most common thing coming back, LPA variants, because that's the people who are coming in. And it's bewildering our cardiologists because <laughs> they're like, you two, know. <laughs> two other important factors of this is that one, LPA is a confounder for impaired response to statins. So a lot of times we see patients coming to us and say, statins don't work for me. Or they're statin resistant. Exactly. What we hear, and, of course, and that's the first not thing it. we do is we check their lipoprotein A because statins don't lower lipoprotein A and probably raise it slightly. Uh, the second is it's a confounder for hypercholesterolemia. If your LPA is elevated, your LDL is elevated. And often it is confused with familial hypercholesterolemia, and it's seen more often in familial hypercholesterolemia. So those are other reasons to know about it. Um, I understand some of the reasoning about why, say, the National Lipid Association did not recommend doing it in everyone. And the answer was that there are some people who have high LPA who never have a problem. And especially in younger kids and, and, and younger people without family history, the concern was where do we go with that? But I think with the evolution of therapeutics and clinical trials now, I think we're moving in a direction where I, the European recommendations, I, I think, are reasonable.